Fantastic. Grab your seats, turn the person next to you and say, I'm glad I live in Queensland. I love the weather here. In Melbourne, it's freezing cold. I bought my first pair of shorts. That was a joke, so thank you for laughing. Absolutely wonderful. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them up this morning. We're going to look at the Old Testament today. And uh, we're going to read out of 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 9. 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 1 to 9. I want to talk to you this morning on a very simple subject of titled Focus. Everyone say Focus. The dictionary describes focus as a central point. You know, in a world that we have so many different distractions, it is healthy to get a godly focus. Come on, if you believe it this morning, say amen. Amen. To know what is worthy of our focus. What is worthy of your attention? Have you ever asked yourself that question when you wake up in the morning? What is worthy of my focus today? What are the things that I need to give attention to in order for me to be fruitful and effective in our life? And I just think in life, we get caught up in so many things that produce nothing or have no long-term benefit or blessing in our lives, in our marriage, in our families. Come on, who knows it can be so easy to get distracted A year goes by and you go, what the heck have I done with this year? But God has anointed us to have healthy focuses so that we can bring blessing on a day to day in our families and in our lives. I mean, the Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 3 to fix our thoughts on Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, Paul says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, church, what you focus on is so important. Think about the idea of sin. You know, one of the words, the Greek words for sin is to actually miss the mark. In other words, you focus on things that are unhealthy for your soul. But the purpose of God for all of us is to actually reach the end. Amen? To actually come to a place that the things that God has put on our hearts, the promises of God when it comes to our family and to our parenting, that we've actually arrived at that place to actually see the blessing of God. Now, there's a story in the Word of God that I want to unpack today that I would probably say is the most unusual story in the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I love looking at scriptures that are just unique and are unusual. And I remember reading this in my devotions a a number of months ago, and it just stood out at me. And I had to spend a few months just really unpacking it in my mind because it's so unusual. When you read it, you wouldn't say that this is a story about focus, but there's wonderful depth in the Word of God. Come on, who knows that when you read the Word of God, it's like mining for gold. You read it the first time, the Bible says that the Word of God, there's a written Word, and then there is the living Word of God. And you can read the same Scripture again and again, But as you read it, God begins to illuminate things out of the Word because there's something powerful about the living Word of God. And so we're going to have a look at that this morning in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 1 to 9. And then we're going to read from 11, verse 11 through to verse 19. There's a bit of the Word that we're going to read this morning. Come on, who loves reading copious amounts of the Word of God? Right? You know, I can tell you funny stories that I probably won't. I'll give you one funny story. But the Word of God is incredibly powerful. So here we go. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 9. By the Word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel. As Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. So Jeroboam was a king. He wasn't a godly king. He was a religious king. He was a king that wanted to promote Baal worship. And he was just was another king in the Old Testament, just that wasn't doing the right thing. And so God sends a nameless man of God to come and prophesy what God was actually going to do. He was standing by the altar to make an offering. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests, 
of the high places who make offerings there and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar, at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and he said, seize him. He obviously didn't like the word. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God, by the word of God. Then the king said to the man of God, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half of your possessions, I will not go with you, nor will I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way that you came. Verse 11, so he goes off. And then we begin to hear about an old prophet that was really with Jeroboam. Now, verse 11, now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Their father asked him, which way did he go? His son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And when they'd saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it. And rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said to him, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I've been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way that you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. What a mongrel. (laughs) What an absolute dog's breakfast of a person. So the man of God returned with him and he ate and drank in his place, in his house. Story goes on for the entirety of 1 Kings chapter 13. The Bible denotes a whole chapter to this. While they're eating, the old prophet gets a word from God that the man of God has disobeyed the word of God that he gave him. The very disobedience that the old prophet had led the man of God into. And he prophesies that he will die. The story goes that the, 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 young, the man of God goes down a particular road. There's a lion waiting for him. He mauls him and actually kills him. And the old prophet takes him and buries him in his old burial plot. The old prophet is still a prophet. He can't get away from his gifting. He's just not a very godly prophet. He's a morally corrupt prophet. He is a religious prophet. And because of that, he destroys the purpose of this man of God. It's an unusual story, but I just began to think about it of the different people that we meet along the way when God has given us a mandate, when God has given us a purpose, when there are things that God has put in our heart and how we can often meet religious people and maybe goodwill people, but people that are not spiritual people that understand the mandate that God has given upon our lives and how they can make us so easily get distracted of the purpose and the plan of God for our lives. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 to 8, he says, you are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. The Galatians were being persuaded by other religious people who were like the old corrupt prophets in the Old Testament. This is a great story about the man of God who had a call of God, who had a purpose of God. He was a pure-hearted guy, but was so easily distracted to get off course 
and lose the mandate that God had for him and in the end really died to the plan and the purpose of God for his life. What did God ask the man of God to do? And I think this is really practical for us this morning. I want to give you three things that God asked the man of God to do that I think can help us in our long-term vision and cause that God is asking us to do. What did God ask him to do? I think God asked him to do three things. Number one, God asked the man of God to deliver a message. In other words, God gave the man of God a message from heaven. And God says to the man of God, go ahead, this is the message that I've asked you to do, go and deliver the message. Not only that, but the man of God not only delivered a message, but he actually also was the message. You know, it's so easy that when God asks you to do something, when God has given you a mandate, it's just so easy to get distracted and persuaded and so many other things that can distract you in life. You know, we've been in Melbourne now for 13 years and we came from Adelaide. This is actually our 10th year as senior pastors of Faith Church. And one of the things I love about Melbourne, I love all the different cafes in Melbourne. In Adelaide, there's about three or four good cafes. And, you know, when you've lived there for a while, you kind of get to know them pretty well. But in Melbourne, you can try all these different cafes throughout the city of Melbourne. Anyway, when we first arrived, I heard about this particular cafe that sold the best croissants in the world. It was written in the New York Times that they said amongst Paris and all the other great places where you can buy croissants, this place had the best croissants in the world. And I thought, this is fantastic. Man, I know why God had called us to Melbourne. <laughs> thought, I've got to try at this cafe. I thought, you know what, I'm going to surprise my kids. My kids were young back then, a lot younger than what they are now. And I thought, I'm going to get up early on a Saturday morning. Apparently this place was so popular that you'd have to line up for an hour to actually get these croissants. And they'd open up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I thought, I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock. I'm going to arrive at this cafe, I'm going to line up, I'm going to get, we've got five in our household, I'm going to get five croissants, and I'm going to surprise my kids that when they wake up, there's going to be these beautiful, hot, fluffy croissants waiting for them. Church, I was a man on a mission. I was a man with a mandate. There was something that God had stirred in my heart about. (laughs) So I drove all the way down to Melbourne, we're about half an hour away out of the city, lined up. Got up to the counter and the lady said, how many croissants do you want? I said, I have six. Five for the family and one for the road. <laughs> and so I ordered the six croissants. I put them in my car. They're in the box. I'm driving down the road. Those croissants are smelling unbelievable. I opened up the box. I took out my one for the road. I started eating it. Church, it was fluffy. It was crispy. It was warm. It was amazing. I ate the croissant. I felt so good. My family are going to love this. As I'm driving along, looking at the other five, I thought, well, I'm going to have the one that I was supposed to have at home. I reckon I'll have it now. (laughs) So I pulled out the croissant and I ate it. It was better than the first one. (laughs) I was about 20 minutes from home and I kept driving. I'm looking at the other four croissants. I thought, you know what? My wife's name is Franca. I'll do a lot for Franca. I think she can take one for the team today. So I ate her croissant. I didn't even feel guilty. There was not an ounce of shame. Driving along, the croissant's amazing. I'm eating it. It's fantastic. Three left. In my head, I began to work out, can I divide two croissants between three kids? The kids are young, their tummies aren't really big, they're quite small, they won't be able to eat a croissant each. I justified it. Sure enough, I pulled out another croissant, ate one of my kids' croissants. (laughs) By the time I got to the end of where our house was, there was an empty box. I walk in the door, Franka goes, where were you? I said, I just went for a prayer drive, hallelujah. (laughs) She goes, what are all the crumbs here? I said, oh, I don't know. 
It can get so easy to get tempted along the way. When God has given you a message, it's so easy to get distracted. You know, it's one thing to deliver a message. It's another thing to actually have a message. And what gave this man of God purpose was to actually have a message. It was his mandate, his responsibility. The man was not only had a message, he was the message. He couldn't write it down. He couldn't email it. As he began to move in the power of God, he was a message to the godless king and the old prophet. You know, the old prophet represents someone who had a message, who had a mandate, who had a call, but he lost it. You know, church, I believe there are two types of people in this world. There are those who have a message. They have a dream. They have a purpose. The fire of God is burning in their soul. And then there are others who've lost their message. And I find those who lost their message often want to mess with other people's message. They want to intercede and let me tell you what you should be thinking. Let me tell you the way that God should be working in your life. It's the sideliners. It's the old prophets. It's those who want to meddle and cause strife. Can I encourage you? Don't be like the old prophet. Be like the man of God, who God has given a message that still burns fire in your soul. Let me quite Clint Eastwood. Ever thought you'd be quoting Clint Eastwood on a Sunday morning? Someone once asked Clint Eastwood, they go, you're worth a ton of money, you've got the respect of Hollywood, and yet you still keep making movies. I mean, Clint Eastwood is like 300 years old, just keeps punching out movie after movie. They said, what is the key for you keep producing wonderful movies? He goes, I make a decision every day not to let the old man in. Don't let the old man in. Don't let the old attitudes in. Be a person that is committed to the mandate that God has given you. Amen? The second thing that God asked the young man of God to do, he says, don't eat what's on offer. Not just physically, but spiritually as well. Just don't accept what is put before you. Don't eat rubbish. Don't get sidetracked by rubbish. You know, we live in a generation today, I was speaking to Pastor Mark about this, that just accept the slogans and the headlines. And I think there's a new level of discernment that is coming in the house of God. What I love what Pastor Mark is doing in religious freedoms is that we're challenging society. Just don't accept the rubbish that is always on offer. Come on, who knows what I'm talking about this morning? And really, God is saying to the young man of God, just don't accept what is put before you. Many times we're so easily persuaded by too many voices, too many experts, too many differing opinions. One of the things that I've realised in my own life is does it line up with the Word of God? I listen to the character of the person rather than the gifting. The third one is this. Very simply, God says to the man of God, don't eat what's on offer, deliver a message. And the third one is this. He says, go back a different way. He says, don't go the same way that you went before. In other words, God is saying to the man of God, will you trust me with your journey? You know, it's interesting, the journey back was not the major highway, if I can have the musicians come. The journey back was a very different road. The, the, the journey from where the man of God started to where the man of God had to deliver the message was the normal major highway that connected the two cities together. But God comes to the man of God and he says, I want you to go a different way. Don't go the same way that you came. Now, the only way that you could go a different way would to go through rocky terrain. It would be going through shrubs and challenging places. It was not the easy way. If anything, the journey back was actually harder than the journey going to the destination. And what God was saying to him, it is going to be a different journey back, but will you trust me with the journey? God asked the man of God, deliver a message. Don't eat what's on offer. Number three, will you trust God with your journey? You know, I believe there are people here today that maybe this year has been a rocky year. It's been a challenging year. 
Do you actually trust God in the challenges and in the ups and downs that God is in charge of the journey of your life? You know, this year we celebrate 10 years of being senior pastors of our church. But I remember even before that, when God started to stir us about the next thing as well, I love just seeing this transition take place. We did a transition with Pastor Alan that was pastoring the church for 30 years. I just think healthy transitions are just wonderfully powerful for the kingdom of God. God is a multi-generational God. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And even before I knew Pastor Alan and I knew the church, I was back at paradise and life was good. You know, we were pastoring, we were helping Pastor Ashley build the church. We had like 40 or 50 staff under us and when Ashley would go away overseas ministering, we were basically leading the church. And really life was comfortable. The journey of our ministry was, was quite smooth. Until one day God started to stir my heart about the next thing. And I remember going on this 40-day fast and God was saying, you know what, the journey that you're on now is pretty good, but I want to take you through a different journey. And he said, I want you to trust me in this different journey. So I began to fast and pray about what the next thing would mean for Franca and I. And uh, as I was praying, I went on this 40-day fast, God gave me a dream. I had the same dream three nights in a row. You know, when something happens three times, it's significant when it comes to spiritual things. And I had this dream that I was working with this white-haired man. Wake up. And I was doing this old heritage house up with this white-haired man. And I'd wake up and think, who's this white-haired man? Anyway, next night, fell asleep, had, had, had the same dream, the same white-haired man, but this time it was a different, it was a hotel. And we were painting a heritage hotel. I thought, man, wake up, think, who's this white-haired man? Third night, had another dream. This time we were doing up an old fibre house, like an old house that we were pulling down the walls and we were putting plasterboard up and we were painting the house. And again, it was me and the same white-haired man in my dream. And we were going along thinking, who is this white-haired man? And we were laughing, we were joking, we were connecting. So for the next few months, I'm driving through the streets of Adelaide looking for white-haired men. No, 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 no. It was about six months after that that God really began to stir my heart and he said, I want you to resign from your current position. I want you to take a step of faith. He said, if I'm calling you to this next thing, he said, you preach about faith, why don't you start operating in faith? And God gave me this word about Abraham climbing the mountain of faith when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. And as the angel says no, he sees a ram caught in the thicket. He takes the ram and he sacrifices it on that altar that he built. God spoke to me and he said, you know, you want to see the provision before you start the journey of faith. But it's only when you climb the journey of faith do you see the provision at the end. So I went to my senior pastor, said, I'm going to resign, going to quit. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I actually wanted to come to Queensland. Had a meeting with a couple of churches, nothing opened up. And uh, someone offered me the job to kind of um, be the sales rep for monster trucks. I don't know if they're still around, but monster trucks in Queensland. And so I'd set up a secular job because nothing was opening up here in Queensland. It was around the same time that my departure date was set. Again, the road into ministry, now the road that I was on was a completely different road. It felt like it was a road filled with rocks. It wasn't smooth. There were challenges. There were ups. There were downs. A few months after that, we had a state conference in, Queens, in, in, Mel, in Adelaide. And uh, they asked me to pick up Pastor Allen, be his driver. And as I picked him up, he jumped in my car, looked at him. And I went, you're the white-haired man in my dream. Now, I didn't say, I didn't say, Pastor Alan, I've been dreaming about you. <laughs> that just would have been weird. Right. After the meeting, we went out for coffee and he said, oh, you resigned? I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, travels, word travels quickly in the ACC. <laughs> he said, you resigned? He said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, being offered a job with monster trucks. He said, God spoke to me about you two years ago. And he said, I believe that you're the next guy that's going to take over my church. But he said, but I said to the Lord, I'll never take another man's man. This guy needs to resign first before I have a conversation. And it was God just beginning to open things up. 
Because I made a decision at the beginning that I was going to trust God with my journey. Deliver a message. Don't eat what's on offer. And trust God in the next season in the journey of your life. And sometimes the journey that you're on right now is very different to the journey that got you there in the first place. That's really what God is saying to the man of God. Hey, this journey is different. It's a bit more challenging. It's a bit more difficult. But will you trust me with the end result? Say so now, 10 years later, the church is thriving. We probably had our biggest years of salvation that we've ever had. We've had like 300 people give their lives to Christ. And I just began to think about if I would have just looked at the natural many years ago and not spiritually what God is doing, I think I would have missed out on the hand of God, what God was leading me into. Do you trust God in this season, in this journey of your life? Do you trust God that as you put your faith and hope in Him, that no matter where your journey is at the right moment, it's okay if it's filled with some rocks, that you will get there at the end. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. We're going to sing this song through once and then I really believe the Spirit of God wants to minister to people this morning. I believe there are people here today and yeah, there's some challenges in your journey right now. The Spirit of God is saying, do you trust Him in this season of your life? Do you trust Him that He'll lead you and He'll guide you in this season? And as we begin to just sing this song again, I just want you to stretch out your hands to heaven and just allow the Holy Spirit just to begin to breathe life and stir your faith in these areas this morning. Come on, lift your hands to heaven right now. Come on, let's begin to sing. Hallelujah. Oh, the saints and angels bow before your throne. Come on, let's begin to worship Him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. We worship you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Come on, let's begin to sing again. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Yeah. You are worthy of it all. You are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. I believe there are people here this morning that God wants you to make a fresh commitment that you trust Him with the journey that you're on right now. And maybe today things haven't worked out as what you planned. You know, some of you here today, you go, I never thought I'd land in this place. What is going on? And the Spirit of God is drawing the faith man out of you, saying, come on, will you trust me in this journey? It's not what you expected, but will you trust me in the end result? And I want to open up the altar call to you today and we're going to pray for you today. But more than that, this is you saying, Lord Jesus, in front of heaven, I'm trusting you in this journey. It's not perfect. It's not what I expected. But I'm trusting that you will lead me and that you will guide me and that you will get me to that end result. And today, if you're in this place today and say, Holy Spirit, I... Today, I'm trusting you with my journey. I want you to come stand out the front here, begin to worship God. I believe God is going to begin to stir faith in the things that you're dealing with right now. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying this is a line in the sand. That maybe the enemy's come and put so much doubt in your life and the things that you're dealing with right now, but God wants to flick that in faith today. That in this journey that you're on, that you will get there in the end because you are saying, God, I'm putting my trust 
and my faith and my hope in you today. And as we sing this again, today, if that's you, you say, I need to make a commitment this morning, saying, God, I trust you in this journey that I'm on. As we sing, I want you to come out the front, begin to worship Him. Come on, there are people that are coming right now. I can just sense God breathing faith in this area of, of the ministry right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to come. Let's begin to fill the altar. Come on, let's begin to sing this thing again. Day, let incense arise. Hallelujah. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Hallelujah. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. I want the pastors to begin to come and pray for people. Come on, let's begin to reach out our hands today. God is reminding both of you this morning where there's unity, God commands a blessing. You know, I just see there's been seasons where the enemy has really tried to divide. The enemy's strategy has always been to divide and conquer. But you've held your ground, you've been strong. You said, we're not going to shift. And God is saying to you today that He's with you this morning. That today you're not fighting this battle on your own. But God is with you in this season. The enemy will try to create division and Create certain little things that will actually divide the unity, but God is with you today. God wants to remind you today that He's the hand that you cannot see. You know, there are things that you're doing with your own hand, that you're doing everything in your power to make this work. But God is reminding you this morning that He's the hand that you cannot see. And in His hand, there's strength and there's governance and there's power and there's blessing today. And I declare a new season of greater unity. I see a new season of greater strength together. One can put a 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. And I declare today where there's been a diminishing return, I declare that there is a multiplication today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And this is a season where God is saying to trust Him. To trust Him in this season. Just to trust Him. He knows the things that you don't know. You know, I just see, you know, you're a good planner. You guys are good planners. You know, you're you're not frivolous. You're, 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 You're good managers of what God has given you. But God can see what you can't see. And I just say, see the Holy Spirit saying, just trust Him in the things that you can't see. You don't know what's going to happen next year and the year after that. And God is saying, He's with you in this journey. Things are going to be okay. You're going to look back at this season of your life and thought, this thing almost wiped us out. But God has been faithful and God has been true. And God has always been there for both of you. Amen. Holy Spirit, just touch them right now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of God, touch them today. Anoint them today. Spirit of God, put your hand upon him today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, I thank you for this young lady. I thank you, God, for your hand that is upon her life. I thank you, God, greater is he that is in her than he that is in the world. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, right now, this season that you're in, it looks so big. But in the new, but you know, in the future, you look at it as, as so small because your faith has grown, your faith has been developed. 
And you'll look back at this season, you know, there's a scripture in the Old Testament where it talked about that Israel was so fearful of the season that they were in. And now they look back and they go, wow, we can't believe where God has taken us. The Bible talks about the enemy walking around like a roaring lion. Right now, the enemy wants to magnify all the things that are going wrong. But I declare today in the name of Jesus that God is going to reverse that. And I declare today that you are a woman of faith. I declare today that God has put His hand upon your life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that today that this is not the end, but you look back on this season and it's been a season of development and growth and increase in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Holy Spirit, for your peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I come upon my sister right now. Father God, touch her right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Spirit of God, for your blessing and for your anointing and for your power today and for your presence today. Church, reach out your hands to these wonderful people this morning. God, we thank you today for the journey that is ahead. We thank you, God, that they are a people of faith. I thank you, God, that you never, ever let us down. Not one of your promises, God, will ever fall to the ground. Father God, I thank you for this couple right now. God, I thank you. God, that you are leading them through this season. God is reminding you today that He's actually leading you through this season. I just see Him leading through this season. I just see this valley that you've gone through and you're kind of looking around and there's a, temp there's a temptation to pause. And God is saying, don't pause in this season. Don't allow your faith to be paused in this season. But you keep just walking through this season. The enemy would say, this is a permanent season. I break that mentality in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. This is not the end. This is just another season, says God. And I just see the Spirit of God just leading you through this season into the mountaintop in the name of Jesus. God is reminding you today, this is, it's not going to always be like this. It's not going to always be like this. You know, the um, Bible talks about so Zechariah, you know, the parents of John the Baptist talks about them being in the temple of God. And the Bible says that they were faithful, but she was barren. You go, how does that work? Faithfulness and barrenness at the same time. Because it wasn't their season, it wasn't their time. Who would have ever thought that they were producing a world changer? And I just declare that they're going to be world changing situations. They're going to come out of this situation right now. And some of you, sometimes you look, you go, we've been faithful to God. Why is this happening? Remember the story in the birth of John the Baptist. The things weren't going right, but it was only a season. But God will lead you out of this. You'll look back and you'll see that God has been with you through this whole journey. You know what? You're a man of good wisdom. You know what? You're smart. You're, actually not, you're not a dumb person. You're actually smart. There's a, real, there's a spiritual intelligence. There's a natural intelligence as well. You have the ability to kind of put these things together. And sometimes there are things that have happened that have kind of defied your intelligence. You go, how the heck is this going on? But God is saying to trust in His intelligence, to trust in His intelligence. You're a good steward of what God has given you. And you're going to see the ultimate fruitfulness of that stewardship actually come out of your life in the name of Jesus. God bless him today. God, put your hand upon him today. Holy Spirit, put your anointing upon him today. I thank you, Father God. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We give you all the praise and all the glory in your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Father God, I thank you today. You guys are together. Yes. Father God, bless him today. Put your hand upon him today. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for strength in this season. I pray for strength in this season. There's a real humbleness in both of you. You're, you're humble people. You are gracious people. You're people that do a lot behind the scenes and no one would ever know. There's a real humbleness towards you. <laughs> but God sees what other people don't see. God sees the sacrifices behind the scenes. And God, this is the promise of God to both of you. He is no man's debtor. He is no man's debtor. Sometimes you go, we've sown, we've sown, we've sown. When is our reaping season? God will remind you today that He is no man's debtor. Jesus talks about those that do things in secret to help people rather than those that do everything openly. You're not the open people. You're just the people that just get the job done. You are working behind the scenes. You are faithful behind the scenes. And the Word of God to both of you is that He is no man's debtor. And I declare seasons of reaping. I declare seasons of increase. I just declare seasons of blessing because of the goodness and the faithfulness of God over your life. And I declare even in this season that there is a season of strength coming. There's a, there's a sense in me that right now you've kind of reached the end of your natural strength. 
But I declare that the Spirit of God is going to come with supernatural strength. And there's a resilience that's going to just come upon you in this season. There's going to be something that right now there's been parts of it. Do we give up the fight? We're tired. We're, re- we're weary. But I declare a season of refreshing coming both upon you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. This is a good word of God for you today. You'll get there in the end. You'll get there in the end. You'll get there in the end. Don't allow the enemy to say that you're going to falter halfway through. I rebuke that fort in the name of Jesus. You'll get there in the end, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for your anointing. God, thank you for your power. Thank you for your blessing today. Thank you, Spirit of God, that nothing is too hard for you. God's reminding you this morning that nothing's too hard for Him. Nothing is too hard for Him. Don't say to God, that is impossible. No, it's not. God is the God of the impossible. There are things in your life right now that look impossible. But God is saying, what is impossible for you is actually possible for God. And God is reminding you today of the impossibility nature of your faith. Your faith was birthed out of impossibility. And the reality is, is God is making you to a great woman of faith. There's a tenacity of faith. There's an increase of faith. There's a resilience of faith. This is a season of faith. This is a season of faith and we declare that today in Jesus' Name, in the Name of Jesus. Thank You, Father God. We bless You today. We anoint You today. We thank You for Your presence. So can I pray for You? Can I, can I pray for You? Just see if you can just mirror up the phone here. That'd be great. Thank You, Father God. Thank You, God, for Your anointing. Thank You, Father God, for Your presence. Thank You, God, for Your, for your favour today in the Name of Jesus. In the Name of Jesus. In the Name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father God, for your anointing. Thank you, Father God, for your presence. Thank you, God, that you're leading him, that you're guiding him. Thank you, God, that nothing's been left to chance. Thank you, God, there's been every perfect opportunity because God has led you and God has got you. are real soft. There's a real softness of heart. There's such a softness of really wanting to hear the voice of God. Uh, There are times that you could have taken on a bad spirit, but you chose not to. You've just kept a real softness of heart. God responds to those that are softest of heart. And I just believe that you're going to be the type of God that will listen to the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit in such a way that you're just going to see the blessing and the favour of God. And God is reminding you today that He's going to take care of the things that you can't take care of. Right now, your life, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in your life and you say, I don't have the room. That's the Word of God for you. I don't have the room. I don't have the room to do that. I don't have the room to do that. But God is saying to you today, because you've made room for Him in your heart, He will take that room and He will deal with those rooms that you can't deal with in your own ability and your own strength and your own mind. And God is saying to you today, as long as you keep your heart towards Him soft and pure, which is what it is, God will take care of everything else. And I just see God going into the rooms of your house that you have been unable to organise and God is going to organise beauty out of those rooms. I just see these rooms that are a little bit in disarray because you just haven't had the time or the energy of the effort. And I see the Holy Spirit going into those rooms and making those rooms beautiful. And the Word of God for you this morning is that He makes everything beautiful in His time. He makes everything beautiful. There is beauty that's going to come out of your life. Sir, there is beauty that's going to come out of your life. You've seen seasons of ugliness, but I declare there is beauty that's going to come out of every circumstance. And I declare that today in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church, stretch out your hands to these people before I hand back the meaning. Father God, I pray, God, in every journey, in every difficulty, in every pain, God, today as we stand at the front here, God, we declare today that we trust you with our journey. And sometimes you challenge us to go down through rocky terrain. Sometimes it's not the most obvious path, but narrow is the road that leads to life. And we receive that today and we embrace that today. In your wonderful name, amen, amen. God bless you.